What is the church? Well, Peter writes in his first epistle to the church and uh, he characterizes uh, them as strangers, strangers scattered abroad in 1 Peter 1 verse 1. Um, so you could say the church is a bunch of strangers scattered abroad. There's truth in that. Um, let's zoom in. What is a Christian? Well, I can tell you what it's not. A Christian is not someone who believes in Jesus. That may be meaningless. Because, as James writes, even the devils believe. A Christian is one who follows Christ unconditionally. A Christian is someone who imitates Christ even unto death, if necessary. A Christian is one who has surrendered his life to Christ. And a Christian is one who loves Christ and belongs to him. Now these are big words. And we must examine ourselves to see if we indeed live up to that. And Peter continues to write to the Christians, to the church, uh, in 1 Peter 1 verse 8, whom, having not seen, you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. When we think of Jesus, do we rejoice with unspeakable joy and full of glory? Maybe we need to realign a few things. And I think that's also what Peter thought and so he continues to write in verse 13 through 16, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Now, there's a lot in here. And um, there are five verbs. And uh, I often say, take notice of the verbs, because they tell you what to do. What do we read here? Um, first, gird up. Secondly, be sober. Hope. Don't conform. And be holy. These are the five things he exhorts us to do. So let's look at them and see what we can learn. It begins with the phrase, gird up the loins of your mind. And this idiom is used uh, quite a few times in both Old Testament and New Testament. And it refers to the gathering up of the garment in order to be ready for action, like for running or even for arguing, uh, as in uh, Job's case. Um, that may sound a bit strange to, to the, the average Westerner, but uh, when you get to know the Mediterranean temperament, you can imagine something uh, with that. But it means to prepare for action, to be ready for activity. The modern um, Western equivalent would be to roll up your sleeves, get to action. And one example of this readiness we read in the story of the Exodus. Um, as we just had the Passover, uh, at least in the Christian church, um, uh, this ties back to that. In Exodus 12, verse 11, it says, And thus shall ye eat it, talking about the Passover lamb, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. So here you see, your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, staff in your hands, is ready to go. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not uh, a relaxed meal, uh, sitting at a table and um, 
taking uh, lots of uh, time to enjoy every uh, bit and bite, but it's uh, haste, hastily uh, ready to go. And um, another example from the New Testament um, is with regards to, to waiting on or expecting of the Lord. That is in Luke 12, verse 35, 36. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. So again, ready. Loins girded, lights burning. It, it costs oil, but it has to be ready. And... Um, so that when he comes, you may open immediately. And it shows also um, specifically here, because this has to do with waiting and watching, it shows there is no such thing as saying, oh, I don't look for the signs, uh, I don't care about prophecies, uh, I'm just always ready. These kind of, of things show that, um, that you're not ready. You're not ready. You can't open immediately. You ha don't have your light burning when you are, uh, are like that. Um, the prospect of the coming glories should motivate us to action, to activity. We cannot live the way God wants us to without girding up the loins of our minds. And notice that it speaks about the mind, and not about the heart or the soul. It's not about how we feel. It's not about what we experience. To gird up the loins of your mind means to get rid of loose and sloppy thinking. To bring, uh, um, to bring our rational minds under control. To control what we think about. The things we decide and where we set our minds on. That brings us to the next thing. Be sober. Being sober doesn't just mean not to be drunk. But it rather points to sobriety. The Greek word is uh, nipho, which means sober, calm, but also vigilant. It means free from illusion, uh, not toxicated. So that means that you're free from any mental and spiritual loss of self-control. And that certain, uh, certainly includes uh, addictions to alcohol and tobacco and other substances, as well as other addictions because they do cause loss of self-control and even have direct spiritual implications. Being sober is really about self-discipline and about self-control. Without being sober, one cannot have a serious look at life. In scripture, being sober is often combined with wakefulness, with being watchful. We saw it already in um, the verse we read from Luke, but um, it's uh, very clear uh, also in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 where it writes, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So be sober, be vigilant. Uh, when you're not sober, then your spiritual defenses are down and you're an easy prey for the enemy. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 6, Paul writes, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So we see here that soberness is the opposite of sleeping. Um, you cannot be watchful when you are not sober. Uh, we know that when you're asleep, and we speak spiritually here, then, um, but when you're asleep you are totally vulnerable. And Peter says the same uh, again in 1 Peter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Same thing. And also in relation to, to uh, watching and to the end of things. It points to the return of the Lord, actually. As Christians, we must be sober. That means we must be free of addictions. We must be free of uh, obsessions, and of uh, passionate habits that um, consume our um, attention and our time away from the Lord and away from our watchfulness for his coming. That brings us to the next point that Peter mentioned. Hope. We must hope. 
in our daily life, hope is always surrounded by uncertainty. We hope for good weather, but we don't know for sure. We may hope for things, but we don't really expect them. And we often give up hope because it simply takes too long. Or it seems improbable. But the hope that Peter speaks of is assured. We can expect it uh, with certainty. He says, it is to be brought to you. And why can we be sure? Because of our faith. Remember in Hebrews 11 verse 1 it says that faith is a substance of things hoped for. Substance. It becomes tangible. It becomes reality. We wait for it. Romans 8 verse uh, 5 25 says but if we hope for that we see not then do we with patience wait for it we wait for it with patience because we know it is coming that is sure hope and so peter writes hope to the end means that means thoroughly with completeness to the fullness to the end don't give up halfway don't waver don't doubt God is faithful. His promises are sure. And thus we must be sober. But hope for what, you may ask? Well, he mentions that also for the grace that is brought to you when Jesus comes back. Because that is the context. We didn't read verse 7 of 1 Peter 1, but there it says uh, uh, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than uh, of gold that perish it though it may be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. At the appearing of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say at the return of Jesus. It's not speaking about the second coming, but the appearing. He appears in the clouds uh, when the trumpet sounds and the, the voice um, calls us home. That's what we hope for, which means we patiently wait for it. We expect it. It's sure. It's a promise. So our approach to Jesus' return cannot be one uh, that many have, unfortunately. Ah, we will see. Um, I don't bother too much. It may be such, it may be so, it may be then, it may be then. Um, we will see. That's the wrong approach. That's not one who patiently waits. That not, that's not one who is filled with anticipation and uh, ready uh, with the, uh, the loins girded, ready to open the door. Our hope must be unwavering, it must be complete, and it must be hope until the end. We've seen this uh, exhortation also throughout the book of Hebrews when we went through that. In Hebrews uh, 3 verse uh, 6 it says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. And Hebrews 3 verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And then in Hebrews 6 verse 11, again, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We see all the time hope unto the end. And we see even here also the assurance. It's, it's certain. We hope for the grace that is being brought to us, Peter writes. And notice that that, it's, that that is present tense. It's already being brought to us. And it will continue to be brought to us. We are saved by grace. So it was brought to us when we first believed. But we also stand in grace each moment. Romans 5 verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access and we stand. It's all present tense. That brings us to the, to the next thing that Peter mentions. Do not conform. First Peter 1 verse 14, as we read, it tells us, Two things actually, to not conform and to be obedient. They go hand in hand. You cannot be obedient to the Father and conform to the world at the same time. In other words, one who conforms to the world is disobedient to the Father. Romans 12 verse 2 says, 
and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Peter does not write conform to the world, as it does, uh, as Paul does here in Romans, but he says um, conform to the former lusts. But actually these two are essentially the same, because the world entices or tempts us, uh, uh, or tempts the lusts of the flesh. The world is totally carnally minded. And that does not benefit the Christian, obviously. Romans 8, verse 6 and 7 say, For to be carnally minded is death. It's death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is en in enmity with against God. Carnality is enmity against God. And so we as obedient children must break off with the lifestyle of the world, which is characterized by Peter with lust and ignorance. And so that brings us to the, the last of the five things he mentions, be holy. God calls us to be holy. And the quote here, eh, be holy for I am holy, is from Leviticus um, 11. So what does that mean? To be holy. Well, it does not mean, as, as many assume, to strive for moral purity. It rather has the idea of apartness, being separate. And not just uh, on Sunday mornings or something, but, uh, as Peter writes, in all manner of conversation. When we get to know God better, we should recognize his apartness. He's not just like us, but better, like a, a superman. Eh? Um, uh, with, this was the case with many of the pagan gods, uh, of the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the, Ro the Greeks, the Romans. They were very much human-like, with all kinds of human um, um, and, and bad characteristics, and lots of moral impurity. But God is not like that. God is separate. He is different from his creation both in his nature and in the perfection of his attributes. He states it himself in Isaiah 46. In verse 5 he says, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? And then in verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. God is separate from everything else and everyone else. And so are his attributes. God's love is holy love. God's grace is holy grace. God's justice is holy justice, etc. Now, with that, he does not hide himself and distance himself. He doesn't build a, build a wall around his apartness, something that we just can't reach. On the contrary, he calls us to come to him and to share, to be partakers in his apartness. And therewith we will become strangers to this world. So what Peter writes at the beginning of his epistle is so true. Christians are strangers. They are strangers to this world. They have not conformed to this world, but they are separate from it. That what, that's what it means to be holy. We share in his apartness. We become strangers. Be holy for I am holy. <clears throat> it's uh, at both a commandment and an invitation at the same time. Being holy alienates us from this unholy and carnal world. It makes us identifiable. Actually, we cannot be Christians without being holy. Holiness causes us to not conform, to be sober, to bring our minds under control. It all goes together. Being a Christian means that we are different from others in every aspect of being, or as Peter writes, in all manner of conversation. It means that we do glorify um, God in everything that we do. And that everything that we do reflects God. It means that there is no sloppiness, 
in our minds and actions. It goes very deep. And that is what it means to be a Christian. Let your light so shine. Amen. 